this morning as we turn to God's Word. Father, we thank you for this morning that you've given us so far. We thank you for uh, the time we have now uh, to, as we turn our attention to your Word. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, um, that we might see wonderful things out of your law, that uh, we wouldn't be um, slow to hear, but help us to see you clearly and uh, help us to grow in our love for you. Lord, I pray for uh, anyone that might have come in here th- this morning whose, whose faith is weak. Um, I pray that their, their faith would be strengthened by this word from Habakkuk 2, verse 4 this morning. Uh, Lord, you have told us that the just shall live by faith and help us, uh, help us now to apply this text to our heart. Holy Spirit, do your work in our lives, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to open now to Habakkuk chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Uh, we're gonna, we'll read verses 1 through 5 just for context this morning, but we're making our way through this book of Habakkuk, and when we come to Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, we come to really the theme verse of the book of Habakkuk. But we'll begin reading in verse 1, uh, I, if, if it's not all, okay, they've got it, great. But look with me at verse 1. Habakkuk says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. This is God's word. Here we see in verse 4 this phrase, the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous shall live by his faith. This is a phrase that's actually repeated four times throughout the scriptures. Uh, we see it in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, we see it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Hebrews 10, 38. And then here, this is the first occurrence of it. When we read it in the New Testament, they're quoting the Old Testament uh, author Habakkuk when they, when they include that. But we see that the righteous shall live by his faith. And what we're seeing is that the, the identifying marker of, of the life of the life of those who are God's people. They are identified as they go through their walk with Christ. They're identified by faith. It marks them out. They're a people of faith. The righteous shall live by his faith. Just by way of review, as we've been making our way through the book of Habakkuk, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we saw that the prophet opens up with these unbearable questions. Habakkuk begins, he says, how long, O Lord? He, He says, why are you making me to look on this evil around me, and and it looks like you're not doing anything? Habakkuk has unbearable questions, and he brings them to the Lord. He is looking at He's looking around him in Judah, among the people of God in Israel, and, and, and he, he is seeing just widespread re- rejection of God's word. Uh, the, the prophet Jeremiah lived around the same time as Habakkuk, and so we can pick up more from Jeremiah of what was going on. Uh, there were false prophets who were, who were prophesying priests, or peace and prosperity uh, to the people, and Jeremiah was, was, was showing how that was false, so that you have these, this, these false prophets who are among the people of Israel. You have injustice going on. You have just widespread wickedness. They had turned away from God. And Habakkuk looks on it, and he just says, how long, Lord? How long? Why? And what we see in Habakkuk is that is a, a prophet of God asking questions that you and I often feel ourselves, even today in 2022, don't we? Aren't there times, things that we go through in this life where we are, we are pressed 
and we ask the Lord, how long until you do something, God? Why is this happening? And we're searching like, like you're walking through a dark room and, and with no lights on and, and, and stumbling and bumping your toe into the ottoman. and it, you're, Like you're walking through the dark is what it feels like. It, it, Lord, what, what is going on? What, why is this taking place? Habakkuk, we see a, a prophet who loves God, a faithful prophet. He brings these questions to the Lord. And when he brings them to the Lord, we saw that he got an unexpected answer, didn't he? He didn't expect the answer that he got. He, he, what, what God responded was is to Habakkuk was, God, I am doing something. He says to Habakkuk, I am doing something. And if, and if you could see it, you wouldn't believe it. If, if I fully explain it to you, you, you wouldn't believe it. And he goes on to tell Habakkuk that he is actually re- raising up another people, the Chaldeans, to judge his people for their sin and their rejection of him, their rebellion against him, just, just as he had promised and long ago uh, when he first made covenant with Israel. He, he is true to that. He raises up the Chaldeans to judge his people. And the Chaldeans are no walk in the park. They are a ruthless people. They're a wicked people. And Habakkuk is perplexed by this. He, he again questions God. And as, you, as we come to Habakkuk chapter 1, toward the end of Habakkuk 1, he just doesn't understand. He doesn't understand how a holy God, a good God, could be raising up a nation more evil than Israel to judge Israel, to discipline Israel, to turn their attention back to him. He's again perplexed, and he's again asking God, I don't understand, I don't understand why. But what he does do, we saw last week, is he remembers what he knows to be true about God, and he he bases his confidence in that, and then he brings his questions to the Lord, and then in chapter 2, verse 1, we see him, after he brings his questions to the Lord, he waits in faith, for God to answer. In chapter 2, verse 1, as we just read, he says, I'll take my stand at my watch post. I will look to see how he'll answer me. I'm going to wait on God to answer to show me what he's doing. And then God responds. In verse 4, we read, he, he responds to Habakkuk. And what he tells him is that the just, the righteous, are to live by faith. They're to live by faith. And one of the things that God does in his answer to Habakkuk is he contrasts the righteous in Israel with the wicked Chaldeans. He, 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 he contrasts the righteous remnant like Habakkuk, like Jeremiah, like those who had not turned their back on God, those who were walking in faith. He contrasts them with the Chaldeans. And what we see is that the Chaldeans, the proud Chaldeans, are never satisfied. They're never satisfied. Uh, uh, But the righteous remnant who live by faith are satisfied in God. While the proud are never satisfied in God, the righteous live by steadfast trust in God as they wait for him to fulfill his promises. If you were to look, and we won't do it today, but if you have time sometime later to take the book, the uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith, where it just says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Sarah, by faith, Noah, by faith, David, by faith, Samson. What a chapter. And it gives, it shows that identifying mark of how they walked in faith, how they walked and acted and responded in faith. And one of the most encouraging things about that book to me, or that, that chapter, is that when you read of those people and you go back and read their story in the Old Testament, you, you know that that faith was not a perfect faith was it? Uh, we can go back and we, when, we, when we read by faith David did these, these things, responded to God in faith. Uh, we remember David, he, he didn't live a perfect life, did he? Uh, we remember uh, Samson but yet he makes it into the hall of faith and so it is not a perfect faith that we'll ever have but it is to be a genuine faith, a faith that fuels our walk with Christ, our obedience to Christ And when we're faced with the most perplexing questions in life, when we're faced with the most perplexing problems and we we ask the Lord why, 
we, we are pressed beyond measure, God calls us to respond to walk by faith. To walk by faith, not by sight, but to follow him. And we see that the righteous shall live by his faith. Look with me, first of all, at verses 4 and 5. We see the Chaldeans in this contrast between the Chaldeans and the righteous. The first thing we see is that the proud live apart from God and are never satisfied. The proud live apart from God and are never satisfied. It says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. Verse 5, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. Who is the he in these verses? Well, it's, it's speaking about the Chaldeans. It's speaking about them collectively, like one person. They, they, are, they are characterized by what he has just said. And God speaks of them as, as this one he, and he says his, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. The Lord is contrasting the character of the proud Chaldeans with his righteous remnant in Judah. Notice the connection between the pride of the Chaldean and the fact that his desires never find rest, that he's never satisfied. He, he is proud and he is never satisfied. I think there's a connection there. What's the connection? Well, first, I think the connection is that because pride is the underlying sin from which so many other sins spring out of. It, pride is that underlying root sin that blossoms and produces fruits in lots of different ways. And sometimes it can produce sinful fruit that looks more dignified. And others, uh, it, it is apparently wicked and evil. But the underlying root sin is pride. C.S. Lewis wrote this in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil, is pride. Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. I think that's right. Pride is an anti-God state of mind. It looks to myself as God and not to God as God. Is pride, which is the chief cause of misery, in every nation, every family, since the world began. And the second connection I think I see between pride and, and this not being satisfied is that you and I were created in such a way that only God can fulfill the deepest longing of your heart. Only God can fulfill the deepest longings of your heart. To try to fill those longings with anything or anyone else to satisfy yourself is pride. Uh, you and I were created with a God-sized hole in our, in our soul that only he can fill. And we see from the very beginning, what did our first parents, Adam and Eve, what did they do? What was their temptation? Remember in Genesis 3, how the serpent tempted Eve. He said, no. He said, no, you will not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you see the pride? Covetousness, rooted in pride, reached forth the hand and took the fruit from the tree in the garden. That's what happened. There is something about all of our sin that says, I know what I really need, and God isn't allowing me to have it, and so I'm just going to take it anyway. Because I know better than my Creator. The Chaldeans have puffed up egos and restless appetites, and so they have no integrity. They serve only their own appetites. They're full of covetousness. Though they're constantly consuming, they're never filled. Their wine betrays them. No matter how much they consume, they're never truly satisfied. They never find rest. Their appetites are like shale, like death. They are never satisfied, it says. No matter how powerful they become and how many nations of people are under their dominance, their desires are not fulfilled. 
This, this is how God characterizes the Chaldeans. They are proud and yet never filled. But the righteous are not like the Chaldeans. And God contrasts them. They're not like the Chaldeans. In fact, the Lord contrasts them with the righteous. And, and we see that here. Look, at, look secondly with me at how the righteous live with eyes on the Lord in steadfast trust. The righteous live with eyes on the Lord in steadfast trust. This phrase is made up of three words in the original language. It is, the righteous by his faith will live. Those, those three phrases are three words uh, alone, and, but the right, it's only three words. The righteous one in verse 4 speaks of one who has been justified. And justified simply means declared righteous. Declared righteous. That's why we see the New Testament writers pick up on this phrase and use it. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Uh, that the, the righteous will live by faith. And, and, and that we're not justified by our works, but we're justified by faith in what Christ has done for us. Uh, the, the awesome, amazing doctrine of the justification by faith. What a balm for our soul that, that doctrine is. And though we tend to think of justification as a New Testament idea, we also see it in the Old Testament. In, in, in Genesis 15, 6, it says that Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham was declared righteous by God because he believed in the Lord. Uh, though he believed in, what, in the promises of God, he trusted what God had told him that he would fulfill it. He trusted that though he and Sarah were beyond childbearing years and still had no children, he believed that God would do just as he said that Abraham's offspring would become a mighty nation. He believed God's promise and that he would give them the promised land and that through this people of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so Abraham was justified by faith, by faith. In Habakkuk 2.4, we see the righteous, the, the justified ones. And just as they are made righteous by faith, what we see in Habakkuk 2.4 is that their lives are characterized by, by faith justified by faith and then their lives are characterized are marked by that faith it's as it, they make their way through life <clears throat> they live with steadfast trust in God not a perfect faith but a trust in God and the overarching characteristic of their life is this faith and here we see the very essence of the gospel the righteous one will live by his faith. We're not justified by our works, by our good works. We have no righteousness of our own. Romans 3, Romans 1, Romans 3 tells us that there are none righteous, no, not one. The gospel invites you and I to come to God as beggars, as beggars and be made into sons and daughters of the king. The only thing required of you to come to him is to know how poor your condition is apart from Christ. Praise the Lord. You, you lay hold of Jesus Christ and his salvation by faith. And this is how we begin with God. And, and this is how we are to live as Christians by faith. I wonder, can that be said of you this morning, friend? Can that be said of you this morning? Have you grounded your life on the word of God, taking God at his word and acting upon it? Have you taken God at his word and believed the promises of God? Are you living by faith that God is good and true and he will fulfill his promises? You see, there's some things we, we see about this walk of faith. Uh, Adrian Rogers says, faith doesn't live by explanations, but by promises. That's so good. Faith doesn't live by explanations, but by promises. When we ask God, we want to know why. And God says, walk by faith. The righteous live by faith. Faith doesn't go by appearances. It goes by providence. A faith does not wait on circumstances to praise. You can live without the scriptures. Uh, we, you, you and I can live without the scriptures, without the promises of God's word, about as well as a fish can live outside of water. Uh, we need the promises of God's word. We need it as an anchor for our soul. Uh, we need to be in the book and be studying it for ourselves. I, I wonder this morning... Uh, are you clinging to the promises of God? Are you clinging to the promise, promises of God with a, a bulldogged tenacity? 
That's what we cling to when we are faced with questions and problems like Habakkuk is in, in this book of Habakkuk. Are you filled with worries and anxieties this morning? Hasn't God said, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Are you filled with covetous thoughts toward others? Do you, do you tend to, to covet as you're, as, you're looking, as you're looking on social media, as you're, as you're seeing other people? Do you tend toward covetousness, toward a, a, a restlessness in your own heart uh, by looking at what others have? Hebrews 13, 5, we have a promise that says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Child of God, you have God as your father. Be content in him, be content with your Savior. Uh, don't live with covetousness in your heart, uh, but cling to the promises of God. So God is using this contrast to teach Habakkuk and us today. And because he is using contrast to do this, we see something about the Chaldeans from the righteous ones, and we learn something about the righteous ones as opposites to the Chaldeans. You see, the Chaldeans are proud because they will not come to God in trustful dependence. They will not live by faith in the one and only God. They would have to deny themselves and admit their desperate need in order to do that. And so they will not find their, their rest in God. They will not find their fulfillment in God. They won't make God their highest treasure. And while the proud constantly seek to fill themselves and yet are never satisfied by contrast, the righteous are satisfied. They, they really are satisfied. By faith, they have looked to the only one who can satisfy their longing hearts. Do you see this this morning? Do you see this? The Chaldeans, whose desires are never at rest, always seeking more but coming up empty, is contrasted with the righteous who live by faith. That's the contrast. What does it mean for the righteous to live by faith? One thing I think we can say that means is that from looking at what's around this phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, is that the righteous have made God their treasure. You see, if the Chaldeans are contrasted with the righteous who live by faith, the Chalde we see the Chaldeans are not satisfied with their wine, not satisfied with their money, not satisfied with their power over other people. And so the righteous, in contrast, are satisfied by walking in faith. They're satisfied. The, you see, Hebrews 4, 9 says that there's a rest to be had for the people of God. Philippians 4, verse 6, there's a peace beyond human explanation. 1 Peter 1, 8, there's a joy unspeakable and full of glory for you and I today, friend, to be had in God in knowing Christ our Lord. See, you and I were made to know God and, in, and to find in him the satisfaction of our hearts. St. Augustine said, he said, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. And that is so true. That is so true. Our hearts are restless until they come to rest in God, our maker, our creator. God's work of salvation is so that sinners can know him and delight in him through Jesus Christ. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? God saves us. God does this work of salvation in our heart. Not so that our lives will be empty of delight, empty of pleasure, but so that we'll find our pleasure in Christ. We'll find our pleasure in knowing Christ, our Lord, and knowing God, the one who made us, growing in the knowledge of him, and walking with him, and seeing him work in our lives, seeing him work in the lives of others. Do you delight in the Lord this morning? Do you delight in the Lord? Are you seeking your, your satisfaction in him? Has your desire for God grown cold, almost non-existent, when you, if you're honest with yourself? Ask yourself this question, is my desire for other things stronger than my desire for God himself? 
that, that, friends, that is a question that, I, I'm, as I'm saying it, it's just hitting me right back in the face. Is your desire for other things stronger than your desire for God himself? Do I desire to know him more than I desire to know anything else in this world? Do you desire to know God? You see, not only are the righteous justified by faith so that they will live eternally, they are also characterized by living daily by faith. The Bible never gives room for a faith that stays in the head but doesn't work its way out in our walk. We're not saved because we have come to know certain facts about the Bible or about God. Somebody might say, yeah, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. He died on a cross for sinners. Three days later, he rose from the grave. Yeah, I think all that really happened. But friends, that's not saving faith. That's not saving faith. You certainly uh, are not saved by your good works. But, but James 2 says of this kind of faith that it is a dead faith. It is a dead faith. He, you see, Jesus died on a cross for sinners like you and I. He, he died in our place, not so that we could just look back on it and recognize the historicity of what he did, but he died to save us, to change us from the inside out. Not to just have an intellectual faith, but a faith in our heart that affects the way we live. It affects the way we, what we value in this life, how we walk through this life. You see, you and I are saved when, when you come to God knowing that you can do nothing to save yourself and that you have nothing in you that can satisfy the law's demands. And, and so you cast yourself on the mercy of God and, and trust in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ for you, for you. It's not just that I believe that Jesus is a Savior who, who died on a cross 2,000 years ago, but that Jesus died for me. That he died as me. That he died to pay the price for my sin. That he rose that I could live. Not that just that he rose, but that he rose that I might live. And he invites you to come to him. He invites you to come to him. Friend, if you've never come to him today, if you've never come to know this Savior, if you've never come to trust in this Savior as your Savior, Revelation twenty two seventeen. I love it. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. John 1, verses 11 and 12. He came to his own. His own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Amen. And this faith that takes hold of the promises of God in Jesus Christ, it shows up in our daily walk. You see, you see it, doesn't say, it doesn't say in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, it doesn't say that the righteous can live by faith. It doesn't say that the righteous might. It says the righteous shall live by faith. We sh they shall live by faith. They are seen. They, are dem they can demonstrate they're walking by faith. And the faith that saves us is a faith that produces obedience in our lives. It produces fruit in our lives. Saving faith is rooted in Christ. Have you, are you rooted in Christ this morning? And then that, that saving faith that is rooted in Christ grows and shows itself, not overnight, not overnight, over time, day by day, year by year, it grows and it bears fruit. And it shows itself in a person's life. Galatians 5, says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That's what... That's what it looks like to walk by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. And, and so, friend, today, ha have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior by faith? Have you looked to Christ, trusting in him to save you? Is that true of you this morning? If it's not, I, I hope today will be that day. I hope that today will be that glorious day when you will call on the name of the Lord and receive from him 
the salvation that comes only through him. And if you have, if you have trusted Christ, you're, you're living, you're walking, you're following him, I wonder, has your love for him grown cold? Are you going through something? Are you going through something in life, perplexing questions that are causing you to ask like Habakkuk, how long, Lord? Why is this going on? And then may, may you be reminded, may you be reminded that the righteous live by faith. Dive deep into God's word. Look, know your God through his word. Uh, grab hold of his promises. Cling to his promises. I, I, I believe that so many of God's people walk through life with such a, a limp, such a weakness, because they neglect the promises of God. This book spends time shut more than it does open. It spends time on the shelf, and it does no good on the shelf. It does absolutely no good on the shelf. It only will do some good if you will open it, and you will get in it for yourself, and you will believe the promises of God and cling to them and walk by faith. That's what it looks like. It's, and it's not walking by wishful thinking. That's not what I mean by walking by faith. Some people hear that. Well, you, well the righteous live by positive thinking. No, we, we ought to be the most positive people on earth. We really should. Some of us, myself included, tend to be more the Debbie Downer side, more the glass half empty side. That's okay. We're going to make it. We need those in our lives who are more the glass half full. But, but what we need, it's, it's not an irrational wishing that we need. It is, it is rooted in the character of God. It comes from knowing God in his word and taking his promises for ourselves and clinging to his promises. That's what we need. That's what we need as we walk through this life with perplexing questions. That, that, those, those things will always be around us. and we need, we need to cling to his word. And so, friend, are you concerned that if your love has grown cold? Does it bother you when sin seems to have taken a stronghold in your heart and in your mind? Does that bother you? You wrestle with that. Are you living by faith? And in the midst of these perplexing troubles in this life, God calls you to live in the way he has said here, the righteous one shall live by his faith. When, when, when you look at the world around you and you question like Habakkuk, how long, Lord? Why? The Lord's reply to you and I is the righteous one shall live by his faith. So keep going to him. Keep taking him at his word, knowing that he's never sleeping on the job, knowing that he, he has done something at the cross. He is doing something even now. He is calling to himself sons and daughters from every nation, tribe, and tongue. He's at work in this world. And the perseverance by faith of his people in troubles of this broken world, I believe this, will stand someday in judgment as a foil against the proud who reject him. Those who walk by sight, those who walk in pride, the, 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 the faith, the perseverance of, of the people of God by faith will one day stand in judgment as an example uh, to them. And so you and I today, friend, walk by faith, walk by faith, clinging to the promises of God. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for your word from Habakkuk 2. We thank you that the righteous shall live by faith. Lord, that you have given us so many rich and wonderful promises that you haven't left us to just stumble through this life, uh, Lord, trying to make sense of things. Uh, you have revealed yourself in your word. You have made yourself known. And so we can open it and we can, we can look to it and find strength to take the next step, to keep walking. Oh, Lord, I pray uh, for any that might be here that, Lord, the questions of life are, are just piling up. And perhaps they are looking to you for answers. And Lord, I pray that in their soul, that you would just strengthen their faith, that they may keep walking and following you, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, for the one who might be here with us this morning, or I don't know how, how many that might be here who have not yet come to look to Christ and trust in him. I pray that they would pray that they would trust in you today. And, and uh, Lord, help us. Help us to not walk by sight. Help us to walk by faith, we ask. 
in Jesus' name. With your head still bowed and eyes closed, in a moment we're going to stand and sing. And friend, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, uh, I, I wonder if, if today you might, if the Lord is calling you, that you'd come, you'd come and I'd love to talk with you, love to pray with you, and point you to Christ. Uh, what is your next step of faith that you're to take? Uh, have, you fought, have you come to trust in Christ, but you've not yet followed him in baptism? Uh, I, I pray that the Lord would stir in your heart and make that clear that you need to take that step. And whatever it is, whatever it is, maybe it's a conversation that you've been neglecting, that you've been putting off, that God is calling you to have. Maybe it's witnessing to a family member, a friend, a coworker that you've clammed up. Would you just step out in faith and point them to Christ, show them the love of Christ and show them what Christ has done to save them? I wonder how God is working your heart. If you'd like to come as we sing, you're welcome to come. I'll be down here at the front. I would love to pray with you. Or if you'd like uh, to have a man or woman to, to pray with you, brother or sister, uh, we, can, we can have that. We, we can have somebody to do that. Father, I ask that now you just seal these truths in our hearts, we ask. And we thank you for them. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.